and Margaret has joined the call. So cool, because I was just about done with my housekeeping. Um, okay, I guess we can begin a formal welcome and get things underway. Margaret, are you are you like good to go if we start doing that? I am all set. I'm going to close my door because my spouse just reminded me that I'm very loud. <laughs> all right, sounds good. So welcome everybody to our Writing Center staff meeting today, where we are very excited to welcome Dr. Margaret Price as our guest speaker. Um, for the purpose of this being recorded, I'll just note, my name is Karen Morosky rigney I'm one of the two associate directors of the Writing Center, and I'm joined today by our director, Trixie Smith, the other associate director, Dr. Grace Pregent, and our assistant director, Colton Winsettler. We're very excited to be able to record this meeting and to share it out with the broader community. Um, there are obviously ASL translators for this event and also live captions. If folks have any access issues during this event, please message me, email me, however you'd like to contact me, text me. Um, but without further ado, I would like to uh, give the virtual floor to Margaret. So thank you for joining us, Margaret, and it's all yours. Thank you. I truly hope I didn't miss something, but um, am I meant to be, uh, I, I knew I was meant to attend the meeting. Is there a specific leadership role I should be taking? We had discussed you leading a workshop for our staff meeting today. Oh, yes. Okay. So sorry. <laughs> um, I completely thought that uh, I was just kind of sitting in on a staff meeting and we were doing a Q&A. We can run it that way. No, I, I think actually what I'd really like to do is, um, I apologize for getting mixed up. There are some visits where I just do a talk and some visits where I do a workshop. And um, the workshop that I'm really focusing on um, this year <laughs> is one where we uh, focus on the question of shared accountability and practices that focus on shared accountability. Uh, and um, I don't know how many folks were actually um, at the talk on, um, God, I'm just losing all sense of time, Wednesday, right? Yes. Uh, but um, I would be really interested to talk to people about um, ways of navigating disability in the Writing Center that um, don't focus on individual accommodations, but instead focus more on those questions of designing things structurally, designing things in terms of accountability. Um, now, I, uh, I see we have a big group here. It looks like um, maybe around 40 to 50 people, is that right? Currently at 68 and the number might climb a bit at three since folks from Ball State might join us. Okay, <laughs> um, and everybody here is a, um, a MSU Writing Center consultant or this is more of an open workshop with, with uh, different people in the audience? So this audience is comprised primarily of the staff of the Writing Center at MSU, but there will also be recruits to um, MSU's graduate programs who might be attending since this is recruitment week. And the folks from Ball State will all be Writing Center consultants from Ball State. So primarily Writing Center folks. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm actually gonna, um, if I have, the ability to do so. Yes, I do. Excellent. The, uh, I'm going to open the chat screen and I'm also going to open the participant screen, um, although that's pretty long, so I won't be able to see everybody who's doing hand raising. Um, one thing that I learned before I sort of jump into uh, the idea of presenting a list of best practices or um, thinking through Writing Center pedagogy specifically, I learned on Wednesday that the MSU Writing Center is already doing a number of things to address accessibility more in terms of universal design and in terms of um, structural changes. Uh, and I wondered if anybody uh, who's been working on those things, for example, on the accessibility policy, um, might be willing to chime in and just give me a little bit more context about um, the work that you all are doing. And please feel free to raise your hand using the hand raising tool uh, or just speak out. I'll try to sort of keep scanning everybody and see if hands are going up. Okay. 
I'd like for the folks on the accessibility committee to, to take the floor on this rather than me just bragging on them. Same thing <laughs> for the folks who were in 495 last semester um, and were part of some of that work. Hi, I'm Em, and I was part of the accessibility committee and part of the advanced topics in writing center class that focused on accessibility last semester. And last semester, we spent a lot of time um, drafting and getting feedback from the community on our accessibility statement. And we hope to get that on our website and start looking into um, deliverables for first year writing program and workshops for how our broader MSU community can incorporate accessible um, learning practices and classroom materials into their work. Um, those are just some of the things we're working on. Some of us have drafted proposals to do a little bit more writing um, to get that put into um, circulation and the even broader community there. And we are also talking about hosting things like an annotated bib, like a running annotated bib where we can um, so kind of set the floor and be an example for other writing centers and other universities to look into accessible practices and incorporating them. Thank you. And um, I'd love to hear from others on the accessibility committee as well. Um, you probably know this already, but it's extremely unusual for a writing center to have an accessibility committee uh, or to, to focus um, so carefully on accessibility. So I'm guessing you know that you're doing groundbreaking work, but um, I would love to hear a little bit more about it too, in addition from, from what M has offered. I can interject. Uh, this is Adriana. We briefly met yesterday or on Wednesday. I agree the time uh, is. Uh... So as a part of the accessibility committee, we've also um, started creating, or not created, started, we finished, um, creating guides for consultations uh, for like uh, accessible writing documents, accessible Google Docs. Um, we're also starting to create guides uh, in creating um, accessible PowerPoints and accessible uh, Google Slides. Uh, we're looking into possibly getting into contact with Broad College, which is the business college here at MSU because one of the professors has started creating and implementing a how to do accessible Excel documents. Uh, so that's one of the things that we are also trying to uh, look into with that. Um, we're looking to create workshops for, consul or for consultations so that uh, new consultants and current consultants uh, would know how to bridge uh, an accessible consultation. Uh, we're also looking to create the guides that we did um, into more accessible forms. So uh, not just in the written form, but we're also looking to record those. Um, those are just a little bit of what we've been doing. So. And I'll interject I, uh, for something that members of the committee have, have been really supportive with and helped develop the resources for this year. That's pretty cool. Um, which is we've developed a pilot that we've tried out in first year writing, wherein in our first year writing curriculum, one of the assignments is multimodal. It's called the remix assignment. And in one section of first year writing last semester and in two this semester, students were asked to do that assignment the normal old way, and then to revise the assignment with accessibility features and to write a reflection not just on the universal design sort of aspect of what it means to compose accessibly, but how to bridge this rhetorical sort of gap in thinking about audience, um, which is a primary concern of first year writing. Margaret, you're a rec comp person, you know that. Um, and thinking about- I still how, shout it. As a graduate instructor, I'm like, audience! <laughs> see? You see? Audience is everything. Um, well, we're trying also to get- purpose. Exactly. Um, and the purpose of the pilot was not just to get students to think about universal design, but also to think about the rhetorical complication and really urgent 
matter that disabled readers are always part of our audience when we are composing, that we are not just writing for an imaginary vast sea of abled folks. And the student reflections have been really inspiring um, and interesting and generative. And the hope is that more and more folks who teach first year writing will be interested in, oh, I forgot to say what we did to, to create this. Um, the Accessibility Committee has created resources on accessible composing for that class. And this semester we're working to develop a synchronous and an asynchronous version of the workshop required to train writers on these features so that we can kind of take that traveling show on the road. The goal being to make uh, accessible composing a Spartan value from the get-go. That, that's so much more than most English departments are doing, <laughs> frankly, especially when thinking about um, some of the really innovative things. I mean, it's all innovative, but some of the things that I think almost no one is paying attention to right now is um, different modes of delivery for trainings, uh, thinking beyond the, um, the, basically thinking beyond the Word document uh, when, when considering questions like uh, description that is understanding that a lot of our communication now does take place in, for example, web texts, comics, spreadsheets, um, documents that we don't really have set ways to uh, vocalize or describe necessarily. Um, it also sounds like you're really, tell me if I'm getting this right, it sounds like you're really working on um, creating something that is sustainable like yes. you're, you're, it sounds like you're working on, for example, since you're working on an accessibility policy um, and also resources that attach to specific classes and assignments, these are things that won't fade away if one particular person is no longer at the writing center. That is the goal. We want it to be woven into the fabric of everything we are doing. We're trying to expand our campus partnerships and collaborations so that this kind of has tendrils that are, are connected to other places and bring in more stakeholders. And that not only enhances the conversation, but it also means there's more folks to support this programming and continue it if, you know, any one person gets snatched by aliens or something. That's, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> You know, what a risk. Uh, this actually is leading, this is a, a perfect um, sort of a setting or, or, or already unfolding practice in which to talk about um, the workshop oriented material that I'm really focusing on this year, which has to do with what does it actually mean to create a culture of access in your workplace? Um, I alluded briefly at the end of my talk to the fact that um, it's become very popular, I think, especially in, in certain branches of scholarship to say, well, you know, it's really critical to just create a community of care and uh, be accountable to each other over and out. Uh, so I've, I've gotten really preoccupied with the question of, well, how is that practiced in specific locations? Um, and so that's what I want to launch into more um, in our workshop mode. Before I do that, though, I'd love to hear from a few people who are not on the Accessibility Committee, um, just to learn a little bit more about how this has been impacting your work at the Writing Center. And again, I'll sort of scan for uh, digitally raised hands, but also feel free to just speak out. I would say in my consultations that I'm doing with uh, clients that come in, I've been more conscientious about how I explicitly use verbal cues to work through the document. So as opposed to relying on that visualization of scrolling up or down on a shared screen um, is to actually verbally say, okay, I'm going to scroll up here. Or also um, we had a, a workshop that talked about the importance of um, any kind of imagery or tables when we're trying to present information to give some clarity to consider if um, that might be the best option. Like with people who have working eyes, <laughs> tables can be a very effective way to communicate information at a glance. Um, but depending on whom we're interacting with, that might not be uh, so effective. Thank you. That's Monique, right? Yes. 
Um, anybody else want to jump in and just talk about somebody non-accessibility committee? How how has some of this work um, impacted your own work as a consultant or in another role at the Writing Center? Hi, Margaret. Um, this is Amanda. I am a staff person at the university. Um, and the work that the accessibility committee is doing has been really impactful for me to see what we're doing as staff members um, and how accessible we're being in our work. Um, just, just in general of how we can in day to day be more accessible. Um, and especially just, you know, having tools like Otter AI or captioning tools um, or especially talking to Karen about how to make our flyers more accessible. Um, just simple day-to-day -day things that we normally just don't even think about. Um, or Jay's talk was really impactful about just having our spaces on campus and how inaccessible they are. Um, and just having a different frame of mind um, this day to day as a staff member, I think is really important. Um, and so just being able to think, I'm also the fiscal officer. So I know you mentioned cost, like actual money cost. Mm -hmm. So that's very important for me um, is always the question of how is it, how much is it gonna cost? Um, and that's always my first question. Is <laughs> how much is something going to cost? Um, yes. But then for me, it's always important to be like, these things are important. So they are worth the cost always. So how can we then work it into our budget? For me, then it's conversations with our financial officers higher up to be like, how can we add these sort of things into our budget? How can we have an accessibility budget um, and have those kind of conversations? Thank you. I am looking for, uh, let's see, other hands. Um, Steph, would you like me to um, vocalize the comment you put in chat or would you like to vocalize it? Yeah, I'm happy just to summarize it. Okay. Um, two other things that I can think of um, from other committees, um, the policy and procedure committee. And um, we took a long time last year um, developing our handbook and thinking about the different ways we should um, package our handbook as a Google doc, as a PDF, as a, um, I'm forgetting all the different ways. We also are doing like revisions to it. And so we're creating an acronyms guide um, because you know, higher ed does a lot of acronyms. And so we're trying to so make much. <laughs> sure um, everyone's following us. Um, and for our workshops, um, our workshops were typically done in person historically. And so um, with the move, we've thought about how we can repackage all that content for synchronous and asynchronous delivery, as well as just in different formats, whether it's a um, for social media or um, reflections, or we've just thought about different ways we can try to um, communicate our workshop material more broadly. So those I think are a few other examples. Thank you. Um, that's a that's a really important thing. Actually, my my graduate seminar was just talking about that recently in terms of how it overlaps with other issues, including linguistic accessibility. Um, or being a, a first generation student or being in some other way, not um, already uh, attuned to certain aspects of academic culture. Um, and I, again, I'm, I'm just really struck by how, uh, how innovative the work that I'm hearing is. Um, I know MSU is, is pretty good about um, documenting what it does. And I, I really hope you all are just like publishing all this great stuff. Um, and really bragging on yourselves. Um, I want to uh, drop the handout for um, the workshop that I um, am currently practicing. I don't want to say I'm, I'm done with it, but it's, it's the one that I'm currently in practice with on um, forming a culture of access or a community of care. Uh, and um, I might need to be talked through this. 
uh, I'm, I clicked on file and I see options including Dropbox, Microsoft OneDrive, stuff like that. How do I actually get a Word file from my laptop into this chat? Is there another way to do this? I would like to open the floor to anyone who's got expertise in this. I don't quite know. I can thing, also just share it, but it's- Yeah, that's fine. Well, I'll, I'll start by sharing it. It's certainly much uglier than like say a, a pretty, uh, a, a lovely, oh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, so Karen, what I'm gonna do is quick email this to you. And- uh, Okie dokie then you can share it. All right, folks, give me just one minute. No problem. So while I'm doing this, this is a good example of something that I might stop to do in the middle of class. And, uh, a little practice that I have is um, trying very hard not to apologize when I'm slow. Uh, it's, it's embarrassing to, for example, not be able to upload a file uh, or to say, well, I'm just gonna email this to my host. Um, but I also am really working on this practice of just saying, that's okay. We're getting ready to look at a handout together. We could probably all use an extra second to pet our cat or take a drink of water. Oh, and actually that reminds me of the first thing I always do when I lead workshops that we can do right now, which is to um, think about whether the space you're in is as accessible as you want it to be. And um, if it's not, is there any minor adjustment you might be able to make? Uh, for example, as you may have seen on Wednesday, I tend to stand up and sit down a lot um, while I'm presenting. Um, today, I'll probably mostly be sitting down, uh, but I also tend to um, shift around, change position. Um, as we get into our discussion, I might pick up my knitting or stim with some other object on my desk. Uh, and I just want to mention that these are all forms of, uh, of engagement that are welcome. Let me make sure that Karen is getting the document. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but I want. Oh no, to that's okay. <laughs> it's again, it's perfectly easy to do these things. Um, let's see. It says it's sent. I'll try forwarding it to your Gmail. Yeah, all roads should lead to Rome. But go ahead and try <laughs> just okay. whatever addresses you have for me, and we'll see. We'll try that again. Um, so while we are having this. Um, uh, pause for information to move. This is also a good time to just think about adjusting your own position, getting a drink of water. Uh, I noticed that um, most people are not using their cameras, so you can also just basically lie down <laughs> or do anything else you might wish to do out of view of your um, camera. Uh, and just think through what you need in order to feel comfortable and um, sort of accessibly held for the next hour or so. Folks, I forwarded all of you Margaret's document as well so that you can open it on your own computers if that's helpful for you. And meanwhile, I do have it here so I can screen Yay, share. Thank you. And um, do go ahead and share that. And then we'll, we'll take another gentle pause to make sure that we have uh, everybody spotlighted who needs to be spotlighted. Okay, so on my screen, I have my handout kind of tiny, which is probably the fault of it being a Word document. And I still have access to the interpreter square. Um, and those people who are retrieving it from their email probably also see it uh, on their own computers. So I'm going to um, gently move forward uh, with, um, with the next item on the agenda of the work of the handout and just assume everyone will be engaging with it in their own ways. <clears throat> uh, 
if you're looking at the handout, you'll see that the first part of it is um, that invocation about access, which is where, depending on what context I'm in, I will ask people to think about what it means to attend to their own access uh, during the event. Now, I started doing this particular invocation years ago. And um, when I first started doing it, I was pretty much just thinking like, oh, if people need to stim, they can stim. If they need to put their feet up, they can put their feet up. But the longer I do this, the more I think about what it really means to attend to your own access in a space. Um, for example, it's quite popular in disability community to say, do whatever you want, lie down, move around, uh, um, I don't know, roll on the floor, you know, whatever, like sky's the limit. But I'm also very aware as a genderqueer person that um, the actual amount of physical space in a room might not be what's keeping me from moving around freely. Um, I might not perceive myself to be safe in the space. Um, or I might uh, be constrained in a more conventional way, like I'm just in the middle of a row and I would very much like to get up and move around, but um, I'm, I'm not like psychically ready to bother eight people for that to happen. Um, so I've, I've gotten very interested in, um, as we're kind of going through the process of moving around or adjusting or doing whatever we need to get more comfortable, I'm also I've become really interested in thinking through uh, what it what it means to be able to adjust some things, but also to acknowledge that um, academic spaces are rarely very accessible at the best of times. Um, and just to sort of acknowledge that we're existing in that reality. I also want to mention that uh, <laughs> This might or might not be true. My perception is that breakout groups are a very divisive issue. Um, I think some people really love breakout groups and some people really don't love them. And I'm not sure there's a lot of middle ground there. I could be wrong. That's my anecdotal understanding. Uh, but I developed a practice of um, letting people, sorry, letting, because I'm, I'm the queen, uh, asking people to choose their own group size when doing group work. Now, if I'm doing an in-person workshop, uh, I typically um, ask people to hold up the number of fingers of the size of group they'd like to be in, uh, one, two, three, or four, with one signifying I'd like to work on my own. Um, in a large group like this, in a virtual format, um, I'm more likely to just say, would you like to be in a breakout group or would you prefer to work on your own? So when we go to the... Um, the small group portion of this workshop, I just wanna give folks a heads up that um, I'll be giving you a choice between working on your own or um, going into a breakout group. And then we'll have another slow pause, kind of awkward slow pause, but we're gonna to try to welcome the awkwardness uh, where people are put in breakout groups, um, or sorry, yeah, where people are put in breakout groups, but then you only join the breakout groups if you actually want to be in a group. Everybody who would prefer to work alone will stay in the main Zoom room. So just, a, just an FYI that that's coming up. Uh, the last thing is um, in face-to-face -face workshops, I ask people to write down questions they may have uh, if they don't feel like speaking out. Um, and in Zoom, of course, please feel free to drop questions in the chat. Um, I also welcome people interrupting me orally. Uh, when we're in screen share mode, I can only see a few squares. Um, so I'll have to um, count on seeing something in the chat or hearing something to know that somebody would like to jump in with a question or a comment. Um, but I do just want to make clear that um, I welcome that. Uh, I'll be doing a little bit of talking at the beginning and then we'll go into a more discussion mode um, uh, part of the workshop. But while I'm doing the talky talk part, uh, please know that um, you are absolutely encouraged to break in and say, wait a minute, can you say more about that? Or I didn't quite understand that. Or I just want to add something to that. Now, uh, number two on the agenda, uh, I. In smaller workshops, we all go around and introduce ourselves. We're going to forego that today uh, because for one thing, I think a lot of you know each other. And also 
that that can be a lot when there's um, so many people here. Uh, but I would like to just give everyone um, 60 seconds for a moment of micro reflection, um, thinking about what you'd like to get out of this workshop. Uh, and whenever I do these things, I always use my phone as a timer. Um, you're also welcome to uh, just use this time to um, breathe or again, get more water, whatever you like. We're just going to take 60 seconds to reflect in your preferred way on this question, what are you hoping to get out of this workshop? And we're gonna start now. And I always reflect by writing, so I'm gonna be writing. And about 10 seconds left. <laughs> and find a good place to pause. So the items that I'm going to talk about here, uh, some of them I'm gonna spend a little more time on, some of them a little bit less. Uh, the ones I'm going to kind of gloss over a little bit more um, are things that I already talked about a bit uh, in my talk on Wednesday. Um, but uh, after I um, kind of take us through as quickly as I can, I can be a little uh, long winded, but I'm going to try to uh, briefly take us through numbers three through seven. Um, I would then like to do a, a group exercise. Um, which has to do with um, talking together in groups or reflecting on your own about a conundrum that you have encountered. Uh, and um, this is a really, really important part of practicing access to me is not spending all our time talking about all the ways that access is going great in our practice but also talking about those moments when we felt like, I just don't know what to do. I, I didn't know how to solve this one or this one, you know, for whatever reason, just was emotionally rough for me or um, required resources that I can't figure out how to get. Uh, what, whatever the conundrum is, the thing that really makes it just tough to deal with. Um, those are some experiences that, they, that I'd like to just think through sharing. Uh, with with the explicit goal of not solving them. Uh, hopefully we will be able to sort of answer some questions or solve some things as we go along today. But I also think it's incredibly important and valuable to think through the stories of times when things are just very hard to do and, and questions may appear unanswerable. So just to give you a heads up, that's what I'll be asking people to do uh, in small groups or in um, solitary reflection uh, after I give a few sort of overview remarks. And again, those of you who were at the talk on Wednesday, I apologize for the parts of this that are repetitive. Um, first of all, number three talks about uh, how we have come to think about academic space and specifically pedagogical space, teaching space. Um, Phrases that have begun to be used a lot include culture of care and community of access. And uh, I'm, I'm increasingly interested in these terms because, uh, well, for a number of reasons, but um, one major reason that I'm concerned about them is uh, I'm beginning to feel as though even as the application of the idea of collective access becomes more important, uh, the ability of large institutions to pay at lip service seems to get more and more powerful. Um, so a uh, culture of care 
in particular appears to be um, a phrase that is sweeping the nation of higher education. Um, my own university, Ohio State, has been using it quite liberally for several years now. Uh, the first instance in which I saw it emerge was um, a report that was released a few years ago about mental health on OSU's campus. Uh, I had a number of beefs with this report, <laughs> quite a number, uh, but the thing that really caught my attention most painfully, I guess you would say, is um, after cataloging in detail all of the university's resources for supporting mental health, uh, the, the report asked in effect, here's something, or asked in effect, what should you do if these are not adequate? And the resources they had named were, um, were just on the face of it, not, not adequate to the task at hand. Our counseling service is, is vastly understaffed. Um, our, the psychiatric wing of our hospital is um, also understaffed and um, was once cited by our own university president as one of the mental health resources on the hospital, on the campus, which I was very upset at like, dude, you can't say that the, the carceral part of our hospital is, is one of our mental health resources. Like, come on, no, don't do that. Uh, anyway, so the, the report just sort of went over the resources that OSU has and said in its conclusion, these really need to get better. And then it is effectively in, posed the question, what else can, can people do? And the answer to this question apparently was form a quote unquote community of care. Now, I had been studying collective access for some years, so I read the page about what a community of care is with tremendous interest. It turns out that a community of care, according to this report, is faculty and students reaching out to each other. I really hated that as a potential solution. Not because I don't think people should do it. I, I think it's great when people are reaching out to each other and, and supporting one another organically, but because the apparent solution for OSU's rather dire mental health landscape was simply to put more work on the people who most needed better resources, who are the, fact, uh, the students and the employees of the university. And so I, I got really interested in how different institutions were using this phrase and I noticed that it sometimes seemed to be a title that was simply placed on top of um, some other entity that was not really functioning the way that a community of care is supposed to function. Um, OSU continues to use it uh, as a label for our counseling services office. Um, and uh, Indiana University also uses it. There were, there were a few other schools um, they were using it. And while I was Googling this phrase and kind of doing research on how it was being used, I found a for-profit business um, that actually uh, included the statement in one of their public facing memos, uh, attending to the community of care improves your bottom line. <laughs> I thought, well, that seems like the opposite of what it's supposed to do. Um, so I just want to be really clear here that I am not trying to uh, criticize the actual people staffing, for example, counseling centers. Um, I am really concerned about the ways that the rhetoric of community of care or community of access um, is used to, um, to essentially say, so the members of this space, whoever they may be, students in a classroom, employees at a university, uh, people within a specific program or a specific division, basically it's all on them. Uh, I think it has a few other effects, um, which I've uh, outlined on the handout. One of the effects of thinking of um, access in terms of community action instead of individual responsibility uh, sort of places disability simultaneously everywhere and nowhere. Uh, one reason why I don't think we should get rid of the accommodation system right now is it is the only system in universities that actually assigns any kind of accountability 
to access. Everybody who else who's doing strong access work, like your writing center, is basically doing so as a labor of love. Um, and so as much as I would like to envision a future world where it is no longer relevant on a university campus, if you are labeled disabled uh, or labeled uh, mentally ill, uh, I do not think we are in that place yet. And so I don't want disability to just kind of um, float away in um, the fantasy that a community of access will just take care of everybody. Um, another paradoxical effect, which I've already talked about at length, so I won't belabor it, is that um, when we extol these kinds of values, but don't actually try to practice them in specific ways, in specific places, um, we end up celebrating inclusion uh, while also actually blocking it. Um, it. It isn't just an empty exercise to say this is a very inclusive campus. It actually is also an action that tends to foreclose further discussion about access. Um, and then finally, uh, I'm always concerned about how questions of disclosure work in spaces that are meant to be uh, to use other terms that uh, Jay probably talked about, spaces that are meant to be universally designed or um, enacting some kind of cultural vision of access. Again, here, the idea that someone might be having a specific issue or that um, lack of access might be unfolding in very material specific ways in the moment, just kind of get uh, sloughed off. <laughs> In, in the idea that this can all be taken care of through some sort of master design um, or, or some sort of um, idealized community where people are putting forth more and more labor to ensure that everybody else's access is working. Uh, I'm gonna briefly skip over language and identification for now, um, not because it's not important, but I think that uh, for one thing, it, I, from what I understand, MSU's Writing Center is super on the ball. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure this is a, a, um, a situation where we need to like go deep on person first language, uh, but also because uh, I think that um, there are uh, a couple of more items that we can talk about that would possibly be of, of more interest in this particular context. Now, when Jay was here, I don't know if he specifically used the phrase ways to move, um, with regard to universal design or um, collective access, but it's a phrase that he coined um, in around in something he published in 2008, and um, I've just been basically holding on to it ever since. It made so much sense to me when he first shared this idea that universal design, that's what he was writing about at the time, universal design is not a place we arrive and it's not a master design that we get perfect and then say, okay, come in everybody. We got the design universal. It is, Jay said, a quote unquote way to move. And because I love this quote so much, I can actually repeat the rest of it from memory. Um, it is a form of hope, a manner of trying. And this has always been one of my really important touchstones in terms of what access really means in specific spaces. Uh, it is a manner of trying. It is something that is actually happening in a hopeful way, but it is not necessarily something that is prepared ahead of time or that unfolds ideally. Uh, and I think people are often quite fond of saying, well, that process is messy, but then not really letting it be very messy. Uh, and so this, the, the notion of access as a way to move not only helps me remember that it's an ongoing process, uh, but also that it's, it's genuinely messy. Sometimes it doesn't look that good. So some of the specific practices that I use in teaching and learning spaces uh, include uh, checking in and checking out. Um, again, that's really dependent on um, group size, but I'll just add a little anecdote here, which is I personally am not a big fan of the check-in, which asks me to discuss how I'm doing. Um, some days I'm very ready to talk about how I'm doing. Some days I'm really not. Uh, and I'll either just find it invasive or I'll just make something up. So one of my students uh, suggested a great 
alternative question rather than how are you doing? Um, we were talking specifically about the pandemic and how it's become kind of a bad year to ask anybody how they're doing. Uh, but for me, at least, this goes for me all the time. Instead of asking how you're doing, my students suggested, just ask people, what's up? I love that question. What's up? Somebody can just be like, not much. Or, oh my God, you wouldn't believe. Or, I just fixed a dishwasher by myself. It just, a lot, to my mind, it is a more capacious question than how are you doing? So that, that's one of my check-in questions. Uh, I, I actually have an enormous library of check-ins that do not involve um, dramatic self-disclosure, um, but that still call for a little moment of mindfulness. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to talk about that more when we get into our discussion. Uh, when I'm able, I also like to, in learning spaces, uh, leave a little time to check out. And that could be during a consulting session, uh, or it could be a class that you're teaching. It could be a meeting that you're running. Um, I, everyone here is a, a strong teacher, so I, I doubt that this is a revelation. But um, sometimes people really emphasize the check-in, and then they forget the check-out. So I, I like the check-out, too. Um, I use a system uh, when I'm facilitating a class or a group space of asking people to call on each other. Um, I've heard mixed reviews of that, so I'm interested to learn about what other people think. Um, I talked about choose your own group size. Um, I use a collaborative note-taking exercise uh, that was taught to me by Allison Pitt. Um, she actually um, published her, uh, oh, I think I spelled that wrong. She published her strategy for using collaborative note-taking within a class on the um, the Haystack website. So I think you can still find it there. Um, I actually don't remember what Haystack stands for. Does anybody else remember? I'm assuming nobody else knows or remembers. So it's, it's essentially a digital learning hub. Um, and uh, let's see. <laughs> The, one of these items has just gotten really irrelevant since March 2020, which is do not monitor digital devices. Uh, on the other hand, there's an awful lot to say about um, horrible practices that are apparently out there with people tracking students' eye movements and things like that. Um, I'm loosely assuming this is not a group where I need to convince people that that's a bad idea. Um, Oh, thank you. Uh, Imari has shared Haystack stands for Humanities, Arts, Science, and Technology Alliance and Collaboratory. Thank you. It's a, a wonderful online digital learning hub. Uh, structure learning around clear objectives. Um, actually, your own Liza Potts uh, said a great thing to me a couple of years ago, which is uh, when any kind of activity, it doesn't have to be um, a meeting or a consulting session or a class, but when any kind of activity is structured around shared objectives, it puts everyone in what um, Liza, uh, what Liza calls the same decision matrix. I'm going to need to pause and ask a question. Is Allison Hitt now teaching at MSU? She's at Ball State University. Okay, she's at Ball State. Got it. Yes. <laughs> ah, I didn't know that. I barely, my brain had barely made the move when Allison moved on from Arkansas. I wasn't ready. Okay, Allison hits at Ball State. Yay. Um, uh, and then finally, um, one of the most uh, important things, and this is something I talked about at length on Wednesday, is return. Return, return, return. Um, again, that could be in a half hour consulting session, in a three hour seminar, um, or over the course of a longer span of time, like a semester of meetings that um, one committee is having. Once I started building return time into the different uh, academic activities and conversations I was having, I, I wasn't terribly surprised at how rich and interesting they were. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a composition specialist. So I was like, yep, recursiveness, that's important. Got it. 
What I was surprised about was how much new stuff we always had to say. In every occasion where I've ever used some version of the return strategy, for example, um, canceled all class readings and activities for a week and just said, we're going to spend this whole week just talking about stuff we already talked about. Every time I've done something like that, so many new things have come up. And it, it's one of those little things that is, I think, pretty obvious, especially to a writing pedagogy audience. But um, every time I do it again, I am re-surprised at how powerful it is. Uh, six and seven, I'm going to talk about just very, very briefly. Um, so I want to pause here and ask, uh, Karen, would you unshare the screen for just one moment? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to pause here and um, ask, we haven't gotten to our small group activity yet, but um, I want to just open up some space for uh, people to chime in if they'd like to, uh, either dropping comments in the chat or speaking out into the discussion. Is there anything I've mentioned so far that people would just like to pick up on and say a little bit more about, or perhaps ask a question about? And again, I will be uh, scanning for digitally raised hands, but also please feel free to just uh, chime in orally or put comments in the chat. Karen put the song, It's a Small World in the chat. It's in my head now. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll go back to singing, I get knocked down shortly since that was the other unfortunate thing in my head before we started meeting today. Uh, I think technically that song is called Tub Thumping. I have a question. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on how, um, I'm trying to think how to describe it, how, how something like slow time or kind of a crypt sense of time can be implemented in a, a structured sort of setting. So, I guess to speak by way of exact example. So writing center consultations are timed, right? Like they're 30, not- Do you do in, 30 minutes or 45? We usually do 30 minutes to an hour. Yep. Um, and, and so the, you know, they're limited in that way. And I understand that those time constraints are really challenging for folks who don't, who don't write in a super speedy fashion or who's processing um, needs or attentional needs are just not specifically embraced by this kind of practice. And I wondered, um, I know it's not the same thing as a classroom, but what sorts of advice or strategies or workarounds, just what, what, what information of any kind do you have on how we might think about that in terms of how we can dismantle ableism in our practices? I am so grateful you raised this because perhaps more so than almost any other academic space, um, a writing center space or any space that does consultation appointments is driven so hard by the chronological clock. Um, I was actually, uh, I, I wrote a lot in my talk on Wednesday about my own work in tutoring centers. And then I took it all out because it was, um, it, it was running too long. Um, but, uh, I, I was really reflecting hard on what it means to have that 30 minute boundary of time or 45 minute, or if you're doing therapy, your 50 minute hour. Uh, what does that mean in, in terms of trying to crip such a space or in terms of trying to make it more um, collectively accountable for accessibility, more interdependent? So, the two spaces where I have worked most as um, in the role of a tutor, um, or as I would be, if I were at MSU, I would be a consultant. Um, at the University of Michigan, I uh, was a tutor for the Sweetland Writing Center 
before it was Sweetland. Back then it was called the English Composition Board. And uh, at my graduate institution, the University of Massachusetts, I worked as a writing tutor at the um, Learning Disabilities Support Services Office. Uh, and these were really, really different experiences. And I think I learned the most about collective care at LDSS, at Learning Disability Support Services. Now, while I was at the Writing Center at Michigan, I learned a great deal about what it means to try to work within that, that bounded 30 minute session. We had 30 minute sessions. Um, and then also not in the least inconsiderable what it meant to try to do my paperwork uh, <laughs> in that same, like just really kind of relentless grinding forward of the day because your appointments are coming and you can't really be like, I'm gonna take a little longer for this one because there's a, there's a line of people you're affecting by doing that, not to mention you're affecting yourself. Uh, you know, if you, if you stretch time, you are often asking more from yourself as well. Um, so I, I did learn a lot at the English Composition Board about that, but then when I moved over to the University of Massachusetts and started working in the tutoring center there, I learned so many things about trying to crip time while still being in that hard march of hours of the day. The very first thing that I wanna say about this is, um, it's kind of a, it might sound depressing, but I, I have found it to be um, a wonderful way for myself and, and people that I'm working with to learn. Adjust expectations. Just adjust expectations about what is going to happen. Now, this was a lot harder for me than it was for the students I worked with at Learning Disability Support Services. Um, <laughs> very, very often, my students had a very clear sense of what they wanted to get done in one of our sessions. We typically had 50-minute sessions. Um, uh, and I would be like more on like a normative time frame in my head, like, let's do this and this and this and this. Um, I also, uh, in that particular job was constantly bringing conventional, uh, writing pedagogy wisdom and getting it like <laughs> disproven. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's kind of a side story, but I, I remember vividly, there was one student I was working with, um, where it seemed as though we just couldn't really get anything done during our sessions. It seemed like we were constantly going in circles or in my view, wasting time, or I would ask him to have something prepared and he wouldn't have it prepared. And I asked my supervisor what she thought I should do about it. And she said, um, try this for an expectation for next week's appointment. Um, ask him to bring his book. Uh, because that was one of the things that this particular student had been having difficulty with was arriving at his tutoring sessions with his materials in hand. Um, and she essentially was saying to me, set one expectation and go from there. Um, I, I don't want this to be, to sound reductive. I don't just mean make things easier. I really do mean think about that time flow as something that is um, really governed by both of you and what you expect to get done during that period of time you have. Always ask, is there some way we can make this um, I don't want to, again, I don't want to sound glib, but is there some way we can make this a little slower? Um, if our goal was to really micro go over one paragraph, what would happen if we micro went over two sentences? Or if Margaret's expectation for the student was bring your book and we'll go over, uh, the two pages you read, what would it mean to adjust that expectation to bring your book? Um, and I don't mean in every case, make expectations simpler or easier. Uh, in, one, in one case, the student uh, that I was working with, I had to adjust my expectation to simply stop asking him to write drafts. Uh, <laughs> so I, I was a PhD student in rhetoric and composition at the time. And I was like, writing is drafting. Writing is drafting, writing is drafting. Everybody revises, it's all about revision. And this particular student, for reasons that don't really need to be explained, 
just didn't draft. He wrote essays by starting at word number one and writing until he got to word number 2000 or however long the composition was supposed to be. And as a budding writing professional, I thought that he probably, he was already doing fine, but I was like, this is going to get even better if you write more drafts. And I kind of tried to make him write drafts, uh, not even kind of, I tried to make him write drafts. And it turned out that that was just not how he was writing. Uh, he, he was doing all his drafting in his head. Um, yes, picking up on a comment that's just come up in chat, it probably would have been much more fruitful for me to talk to the student. Um, although, I mean, with this particular student, he he just really, really was a, I just process it in here and then it comes out here. Like he was just that writer. Um, and it took me a long time. And I will say the student was very patient and gracious with me where I eventually realized this is how you draft. Um, I can do other things to be helpful as your writing tutor, uh, but forcing you to draft in ways that are legible to me is not one of them. Okay, so back to Karen's question, which is really about what it means to, to kind of crip that time. Insofar as it is possible, it's been really important for me to let go of notions of rigor um, and uh, sort of what, what a class or a session is supposed to achieve. Um, so another move that I've made in the classes I teach is to really cut down on the amount of required reading because I want to work through the readings that we are doing or the viewings or whatever we're focusing on um, with more slowness and more flexibility. And I want to build in that return time. It means that we are not quote unquote covering as much material. Um, and I am honestly not sure I'm always doing my students a favor. Uh, I think that um, oftentimes it would really be useful if I assigned more stuff and we, went faster or at least more useful for some of my students. But at least right now, I'm trying out the idea of just doing less in the classroom and seeing if people still seem to get out of the class what they need to get out of it. The constraint, of course, is always that in academia, you got to get stuff done. If there's a student in a consulting session, they got to get their paper done. If you're a teacher teaching a class, you probably were handed a list of objectives and told these are the objectives you have to meet or your students have to write five essays or whatever those external constraints are. So I want to acknowledge, I realize we're not always moving through a field of complete freedom as we make these choices. But whenever possible, when thinking about those rigorously bounded sections of time, um, the first question I will always ask myself is how can I adjust expectations? And sometimes that means uh, like just kind of trying to dodge around requirements a little bit. Uh, but more often it just means saying, oh, if we go slower, we actually end up learning more. Does anyone else wanna um, ask, uh, like just mention a practice or follow up on anything, um, ask about something that might be talked about at more length? I'm going to do another quick scan for digital hands. Okay, Karen, can we go back to the handout? Yep. <clears throat> I want to make sure I leave plenty of time for the part where we discuss specific scenarios because that's always my favorite part. And as long as I'm just like completely forgetting what our agenda was for today, Karen, we're going right up until four o'clock, right? Yes. Like I can steal your time until four o'clock. You you are being given our time. I'm okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Great. All right. So back to handout. Um, I don't think that uh, it's. Uh, yeah. Well, I I think that um, both of these issues six and seven may come out more when we talk about specific situations. Um, and I also think that Jay probably covered uh, um, the, the stuff on um, stereotypes or ableist narratives um, really well, uh, because that's one of the things he does so beautifully in, in all his work, maybe especially his book, Academic Ableism. Um, but a couple of 
uh, narratives that I want to point to because they are ones that I think are especially prevalent or are ones that have been problems for me um, are narratives having to do with uh, uh, students who are trying to get away with something um, or uh, who are perhaps um, in some way uh, faking or perhaps blowing out of proportion something that they need. Um, so in terms of the getting away with something narrative, this may be one that you actually have to talk to other people about. I, I think that one of the most um, popular things to say about um, disabled learners is that uh, they're trying to get stuff they're not supposed to have. Um, so you might be a staff member in the position of trying to help a faculty member adjust their expectations. <laughs> uh, or you might be sort of thinking to yourself, you know, er, I'm not sure this is really an impression I want to be having of a student. How can I kind of wrap my mind around it differently? In terms of the unfair advantage uh, stereotype of what an accommodation is, um, this is something that students I teach in disability studies classes um, often have. Uh, there's a, a concern that people who have legally mandated accommodations, such as extended time on tests um, or uh, a note taker designated just for them, or in the case of faculty or staff, um, some one of my own accommodations is a communication assistant, um, which certainly we would all like to have communication assistants to help us function better in the world. Uh, but there, there can be a prevailing stereotype that these things are unfair advantages. And when I'm trying to think through this stereotype with students that I teach, the question that I often ask about it is, what is the benefit accruing to the person who has this supposed advantage? What, what is it exactly that they are getting? Um, and we can think that through almost like a thought experiment in the case of a specific accommodation, such as, for example, extended time on tests. Well, what does the university require you to do in order to get extended time? Well, you have to register with the Office of Disability Services. You often have to undergo um, expensive and certainly extensive testing. Um, you have to disclose in a variety of situations, including to your own professors who may or may not be um, super happy to learn that you are disclosing a disability. And then you have to figure out where that extended time is gonna come from. Uh, you have to follow whatever rules your school or your program has in terms of how you actually make use of that extended time. So we kind of go through that thought process, kind of what does it cost to get this particular accommodation? And then we think through what is the benefit that accrues to the person who has it? Um, and this one is often harder to answer, uh, but ultimately where we usually get with this train of thought is, well, if you do better in school, then you have a better chance at a good job um, or you have a better chance at scholarships or um, other things that the, the inevitably sort of cost benefit structure of school might award you. And going through that thought experiment and really thinking through what benefits disabled people may receive versus what those benefits actually cost to make use of can be very illuminating. Again, I don't think this is necessarily a group that needs to be persuaded that access is a good thing. Um, but that can also be a useful conversation to have when attempting to negotiate with someone um, deeply unpersuaded. For example, a faculty member who may be frustrated with that their classroom is being disrupted um, or uh, another person who just feels like, well, that seems unfair. Uh, it also is important to explore um, or just be aware of the narrative um, I'm not sure if this is something Jay talked about at length or not. He's written about it beautifully. Uh, the notion that people with disabilities are faking. And this gets to a, a topic that I have written about and studied a lot, the notion of disclosing disability. But the discussion about this 
tends to follow a similar path as the discussion about the benefits that may accrue to a disabled person. Um, namely, it's hard to imagine a scenario where um, faking a disability brings such a shower of good things <laughs> that, that one would choose to do so. Um, and, and certainly this is, this is not universally true that no one would ever fake a disability, but this is one of those stereotypes or narratives that tends to live on, not because it's prevalent, but rather because it speaks to some of our deepest cultural fears. Um, and especially in the, universe, in the United States um, higher education system, one of the things that we are all trained to fear a lot is that someone else might be getting ahead of us. Um, this is why in my talk on Wednesday, I talked a lot about the rhetoric of the line. Um, one of the things that I am most frustrated about in most institutions of higher education is that almost all of the discourse that, that um, is available to us has to do with the ways that we are in competition with each other. Um, you know, there's, there's one little pizza and we're all expected to jump on it and have a fight about it. Uh, and that's, it is true a lot of the time, given the way academic budgets are written, but it doesn't have to be true. Um, so thinking about um, how this might apply to a program or a center or a shared workspace, what are the environmental ways in which we can just make it less of a pizza? <laughs> basically <laughs> make it less of something that appears to have a finite number of pieces that people are grabbing for and make it seem more like something where the abundance available to us is created by our shared capacity. Now that sounds lovely and it sounds very nice. It's a lot harder to make it happen, uh, but it's, um, it's a perspective shift that uh, I think is, is very useful to think about. Uh, and then finally, how to's, what not to do's and checklists. This is largely me talking about why checklists are concerning. Um, although recently I've begun to moderate this point of view uh, toward how to build a better checklist. Um, as I've gone further along in my academic career, I have found myself responsible for policy a lot of the time. And policy is essentially a document or some text saying, Here's how you must do something, and here's a checklist of things not to do. Uh, so I do think that these things um, uh, can be designed better. Um, the main thing that I would urge in terms of writing policies and checklists, again, I'm not sure this is something this particular group needs a lot of schooling on, uh, is think about designing those kinds of policies or documents in ways that open space rather than close off possibilities and especially in ways that emphasize what we're designating here is a baseline or a floor. This is not, my, my spouse is an architect and, and likes to say, this is a floor, not a ceiling. Um, what we're saying here is here are some basic things or starting things that will build a strong foundation, but then remember that we can and should go on and up from there. I'm going to pause there again. We have 15 minutes left, and I want to make sure we have a little bit of time to talk about specific situations that are of most interest and concern to you. Karen, would you mind unsharing the document? Thank you. All right, I'm just peeking at our crowd to see where my Ball State people are at. Hi, I don't really know what school people are at, but I'm just saying hi to everyone. Hello, so nice to see you all. All right, so everybody feeling ready to either stay by themselves or go into small groups? All right, hi, hi from Ball State. All right, now this might be a massive failure because I don't think I have, no, I don't. I don't have the power to actually put people in breakout groups. <laughs> so I'm either asking Adriana or Karen to do this. And if it's a, a terrible failure, then we'll do it some other way. Um, but my, my impulse is to say, go ahead and divide our group into um, groups of about four. And um, then my, uh, my blanket um, direction to everyone is, if you like breakout groups, go into the breakout group you've been assigned. If you don't like breakout groups, 
just stay here in the main Zoom. So Karen or Adriana, are you now able to put people in breakouts? Yes. So what I'm going to do is actually do the assign automatically thing. Yep. It'll be four to five participants per room. If you don't want to opt into that, that's totally fine. Yep. And we'll try to leave some time at the end of the session for Q&A and, and wrapping that sort of stuff up together. Yes. So I'm going to okay. hit create rooms. You can go if you want. You can stay. Okay. okay. Wait, don't go yet. Oh, okay. I'm going to give people their prompt for the rooms. Uh, it's a pretty simple prompt, uh, and we're not going to require any report out. This is just an opportunity to think this through, and we can address it more in Q&A. What are some unanswer seemingly unanswerable questions or conundrums about access that you are experiencing in your work as a professional, in your work as a student? Um, conundrums or unanswered, unanswerable? I'm really interested in those questions that are very hard to answer. So let's just take five minutes in groups. Uh, and then Karen, after five minutes, I'll ask you to um, uh, call people back for Q&A. Sure. So it's 348 now. At 353, I'm going to bring everybody back. OK. Kind you of get 60 seconds to come back. So yeah. technically, it's a six minute breakout. Yeah. Whoosh, here we are. Um, well, <laughs> as, as someone who specializes in the accessibility of various spaces, including video conferencing spaces, there is a very active discourse about the act of reporting out and what that means and whether it's necessary. So I'm happy to report today that due to time constraints, we're not reporting out. <laughs> We are just enjoying the quality of the conversations that we just started and thinking about how we can build on those conversations. Uh, it's 3.54. Karen, do you want to uh, open some time here for, for Q&A? Yes. If folks have questions for Margaret, now's a great time to ask them. If you ask things in the chat, I can read them out for you. Alternatively, you can just unmute yourself and go for it. So we have a question in the chat. How do we deal with professors who care more about cheating than accessibility? <sighs> Summon patience. <laughs> um, I, I have had some version of this conversation with many, many, many of my colleagues. Uh, Generally, my approach is some version of the gradual thought experiment approach that I described before. That is, first, I really, audience in context, I really try to understand what the audience in context um, and purpose at hand are. So um, what does the professor perceive um, is is everybody gonna get from the activity that's being cheated on? In what ways is the cheating act itself interfering with that purpose? And um, in a sense, who is the faculty member themselves as an audience to that cheating? Um, way back in the day, I wrote an article on plagiarism. Uh, so I've, I've been very interested in plagiarism ever since then. Uh, and one of the things that interests me most about the question of plagiarism as it's discussed, less so within composition and rhetoric, but um, kind of across the board is, plagiarism is often discussed as a personal affront to whoever gave the assignment. Um, and I, I understand that this is a natural emotional reaction. If I discover that one of my students has done something I think is unethical, I feel personally affronted. I feel hurt or I feel angry. Um, I feel like it's about me. 
Um, so one of the things I try to unravel in this thought experiment with the faculty member is um, who do they think this is about? Uh, and um, I don't always get to a great place with these conversations, but I at least am able to uncover things that I might that might not otherwise even have been fully acknowledged by the professor themselves. Like, yes, I think that a sine qua non of my class is being able to memorize these exact things. Um, or I think that uh, it's absolutely critical that people be able to perform at the following speed when writing in the following genre. Now, I may not agree with those particular standards of teaching a writing class or whatever it is kind of class, but at least getting clarity on that gets us one step closer to, does it have to happen that way? The thing is, it's, I'm sure people could think of counterexamples, but in my opinion, it's not that hard to design a class where students are disincentivized to cheat. Um, but if someone is having a lot of problems with students cheating, as opposed to imagining students cheating, which is sort of another issue, uh, then somehow students have been incentivized to do that. And uncovering what the actual task is, what again, what is the purpose, what is the context, can sometimes help figure out, well, you may have to let go of some of your favorite ways of teaching, but at least you can reduce how much you're incentivizing this behavior. Do folks have any lingering questions, any last things they'd like to ask before we part ways for the afternoon? I'll go get Ivy. Cool. Come here. <laughs> so those of you who have seen present afternoon. in person before have met my little dog, Ivy. Here she is. Hi, Ivy. She's now very old. I'm holding up a little uh, brown and gray chihuahua to the camera. And she's looking around in confusion because I, I fully just woke her up out of a deep sleep. <laughs> the chat is now aflame with dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Ivy says that's correct. That's as it should be. <laughs> well, now, Margaret. if people would like to follow up with questions for me, you absolutely are welcome to. Um, also, I tend to be very slow on email. So uh, if you send me an email and I have an answer within a couple of days, please just resend the email. I promise I wanted to answer it. <laughs> thank you so much everyone for joining us today. And thank you, especially to Margaret and Ivy for sharing their afternoon with us. Hey, um, thank you all so much. I honestly was not super clear on what I was doing at a writing center meeting, which is totally my fault, but um, what a completely delightful group and what a truly impressive writing center. I'm not just saying that like, I've seen a few writing centers. You guys really are the bomb. That really means a lot to us. Thank you so much for saying that. Of course. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I hope everyone enjoys their afternoon. Again, Margaret, Ivy, it was a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks so, everyone. so much.